so we've started to record the session. It will be made available afterwards, so if you have colleagues who weren't able to join us or um, if you'd just like to, to refresh uh, what we went through, then we'll have that ab available for you. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to, to Josh to kick us off. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Kate, and I uh, appreciate all the work you've done to help get this session organized and support it all. So um, I'm going to, well, let me first just uh, give a little bit of my background. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Information Technology for Digital Education here at Maros College. We're located in Poughkeepsie, New York, about two hours north of New York City. Um, and I oversee our academic technology office, which has been spearheading learning analytics research here at our campus for the last several years. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is just set some context here um, by giving a very brief kind of 50,000-foot high-level overview of at least what I see on the learning analytics landscape today. Uh, I'll move on then to give a little background on the Open Academic Analytics Initiative, or OAI, project that Maris was leading. Uh, over the last several years, um, and that's important context, I think, for the current work, which then I'll uh, briefly mention but turn over to Alan and uh, Gary to speak about, because at least some of the work that's going on today in the perioloading analytics community is building on top of the OAI project work that we started uh, a couple of years ago again here at Marist. Uh, we'll end with a, a demonstration. Uh, uh, always like to kind of put our uh, code forward here so people can actually see some things running and see the work that's taking place. As Kate mentioned, we really want to make sure that we uh, have a, a decent block of time at the end. We're hoping for, for 10, 15 minutes at least for Q&A and discussion, so please note your questions as, as we go, and we'll uh, make sure we have time at the end, and then obviously can always do some follow-up via email and other calls and so forth. So with that, uh, Kate, you want to move to the next slide? So the first thing I'm going to do, and you can pull up actually the next slide here, is just level set here a little bit on terminology. Um, at least I still find learning analytics to be a very kind of new and emerging field. And as a result, there's terminology that's tossed around a lot that A, not everybody is familiar with, and B, sometimes means different things to different people. So just to, to kind of make sure we're on the same page here with some of the key terms that will come up during the session, at least I and I think others tend to categorize some of the work happening in the analytics field and higher ed into kind of two broad categories. We have uh, academic analytics, which tends to be more about using uh, business intelligence tools to uh, examine and work and to improve the business of the institution, the running of the college or university it might be have. So looking at things like enrollment data, tuition dollar data, things of that nature, tends to be a bit more for management and executive kind of audiences. Uh, learning analytics, which is obviously the focus of today's session, is using those same tools, but now focus more on uh, improving and enhancing the teaching and learning process. Uh, these uh, tools and, and applications tend to be focused more for students and, and faculty members to use. Uh, so I think much of the work, if all of the work in the Imperial community right now, is focused on the, the right side of that chart in terms of the learning analytics area. So um, again, very high level, but in terms of, of what I see at least on you know the kind of the peaks on the learning analytics landscape today in terms of different types of applications that are emerging, uh, the the one that I think most people are most familiar with is uh, academic early alert systems. So these are systems that are using uh, business intelligence and predictive analytics tools to be able to identify students who are at risk to let's say not complete a course or maybe not complete a degree program, and then obviously provide interventions to help those students be successful. I'll talk a little bit more about that because uh, it's the specific work that we are pioneering here at Maris in the OAI project a couple of years ago was in that space. Uh, another area that I'm really particularly intrigued by is the data visualization area. Uh, the idea of using sophisticated data visualization tools that take a uh, set of data that might uh, take human beings a long time to understand and, and analyze in a kind of text-based format and present it to them in a visualization that makes it very easy to very quickly understand that information. And so the concrete example maybe I'll toss out as a tool that we've been exploring here at Maris called SNAP. It's a social network visualization tool uh, that allows you to take the interactions happening in online discussion forums and create a uh, social network map. The icon on the screen actually is from that system, so you can see what it looks like there. 
And it very quickly tells an instructor who are the most influential people in the discussion, uh, online discussion, something which could take uh, many hours, actually, I think, in a, in a large online discussion, let's say in an online course, to, to distill that same information. Another area is student advising and recommendation systems, so using analytics to help advise students on things like what are the next courses you might take in the sequence in your program. Also things like what kind of services are available for students, and I think particularly for adult learners, uh, adult student populations, ability to match a student with, let's say, uh, services, let's say uh, uh, child care services that they can get access to while they're in class. <coughs> that kind of uh, system, I think, is very powerful. And uh, one of the groups working in the Imperial community right now is the Student Success Plan, which is an open source version of that kind of tool. Uh, last one uh, that I'll hit here, which uh, and there's a little bit of echo. Um, it might be me causing it, but if people aren't on mute, that might be helpful to do. But the last category here is adaptive learning and cognitive tutoring uh, systems. Uh, I think that these hold a huge potential, a uh, bit longer term because they're still maturing. The idea is uh, of software that can actually, based on a knowledge map of a certain domain, let's say linear algebra, is able to then really work with the student one-on-one -on -one to understand where the student might be confused, uh, you know, where, where they have a misconception in the, in the knowledge that they should have in order to solve let's say a linear algebra equation, and then scaffold that student to help them develop the skills they need, ultimately get it to the point where they can master those core subjects. Personally, and I'll go out and limit on a prediction, I think we're going to see these cognitive tutoring systems get as good as a human being at basic skill development um, in the next, you know, five or so years. So I think that's an area that uh, I'm certainly watching closely, though I think will be quite uh, interesting. Uh, another kind of, again, uh, high level, 50,000 50, foot um, observation, at least I've had over the last couple of years of working in this space, is I've seen institutions, certainly Marist has fallen to this same kind of um, uh, process, tend to move through three major stages of using analytics. Um, I think the first stage tends to be pretty uh, basic kind of reporting of data, summarizing historical data, so maybe you want to see what do, uh, you know, what, what, what are the current enrollments in the last semester in my MBA program. And that might not sound like the most powerful thing, but go back 10, 15 years, and I don't think we were doing a lot of that kind of data-driven decision, decision-making in higher ed. And so I think the fact that pretty much all institutions are doing that kind of reporting, I think, is, is significant. The next stage, uh, stage tends to be around more analyzing uh, the data, looking for trends and correlations. So what is the relationship between students who drop out of our MBA program and maybe enroll in our accounting program and, and trying to understand what are those trends look like and correlations look like. Again, a powerful concept, I think something that many institutions are doing today, maybe not everyone, but I think many, many are starting to deploy that kind of an analytics. The third stage, and I might argue the most powerful and significant, is this predictive analytics uh, work. And that's, that's what a lot of the, the work that we have been doing in the imperial community kind of falls into that category. And here the idea is that you're going to go and use huge amounts of historical data. That's where the big data concept obviously comes from. You're going to uh, bring that data together, mine that data with sophisticated machine learning algorithms, looking for these kind of hidden patterns in that data. Often those patterns are pretty obscure and subtle. But once you find those patterns, you can then create these predictive models that allow you to actually project out and predict uh, behaviors, learning outcomes, things that are going to happen in the future. Now, obviously, once you've made that prediction, now you have the power to actually uh, influence the future and actually maybe change that prediction. So maybe taking a student who is going to not uh, complete a program and turn them around to be successful. And I think that holds tremendous power for addressing many of the large, significant challenges in higher education today, such as college retention rates and, and, and so forth, um, completion rates, which I'm sure everybody but working in higher ed is pretty familiar with in terms of those, those issues. The last kind of high-level landscape uh, observation I'll share is around what I think are some really important strategic issues for institutions to be thinking about carefully as they move into this learning analytics space and begin to deploy these solutions on their campuses. So uh, one is around kind of strategies of kind of software-centric analytic solutions versus the platform solution. And at least over the last 
three to five years, my observation has been we've seen a lot of the, the software-centric solutions rolling out. So maybe your LMS has a analytics tool, a set of tools in it. Maybe your student information system now does. Maybe your library system has an analytics tool. But each of these are built into individual software systems, which I think creates a fundamental limiter on the power that you can really get from learning analytics because it really isolates the data that you're working with into these silos of different software systems, not allowing you to really take advantage of some of the big data concepts. So as you'll see a little bit later in the webinar, uh, we've taken more of a platform solution approach uh, with the idea being that rather than having these individual solutions, we want to build a platform that allows us to collect data from many, many systems where we're recording digital information about students, bring that into a central location, have a central uh, set of powerful uh, learning analytics, machine learning, data mining tools that can then be used to exploit that, that big data, ultimately then uh, being able to do things, everything from academic early alerts to data visualization uh, to some of these recommendation things, but do that all through one platform rather than separate tools. So I think it's, it's, it's something that institutions need to think about as they begin to invest in, in, in this learning analytics area. Uh, open versus closed. Um, I'll hit those quickly. I'm probably being pushed to go through. So open versus closed. Uh, yeah, I think there's there's pluses and minuses on both sides. But when you start looking at predictive models, for example, we've released our predictive models under open licenses, and I think proprietary companies often uh, don't do that. And I think there's some importance in terms of being able to understand uh, what's happening in that predictive model, what what what's actually going on to tell you that a student is going to fail a class, and so forth, and also very powerful in you being able to tune and change and adjust those models as well as share those models across institutions, which is something that we're starting to do in Aperio as well. The last issue here is around ethics and privacy. Uh, these are critical issues when you're dealing with this kind of confidential data, and, and in the interest of time, I'll just say that I think it's really important that institutions pay attention to that early on in their rollout of this technology. And part of what's happening at her right now is creating some kind of generic frameworks, policy documents that would be released under Creative Commons licenses that deal with ethics and privacy that people can share across institutions. So let me move on, and I'm going to kind of uh, accelerate here a little bit. There's a lot more information about this project uh, online that I'll reference here at the end, so I'll try to make sure I, I end here in a few minutes to move over to share uh, turn it over to Alan to, to talk more about some of the Aperio work. Um, so uh, the OAI project was originally funded uh, through the Educause Next Generation Learning Challenges Program, which received funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We had about a quarter of a million dollars over about really two years for this project. And the goal was to create one of the world's first open source academic early alert systems that would allow us to identify which students in a specific course were at risk to not complete that course successfully. Do that early in the semester, so our goal was to be able to do an accurate prediction in the first two to three weeks of, let's say, a traditional 15, 16 week course. And then obviously once we uh, were able to identify those predictions, we or those students, we, um, sorry, my screen just went blank. We uh, rolled out interventions to help those students be uh, successful. We also did a range of research, which I'll speak to here in a minute. This uh, next slide gives you a broad overview of how the system works. So we're working with two primary data sets. Uh, data coming from our student information system. This was primarily student aptitude and demographic data. And we were also working with student uh, data from our learning management system, so event log data and gradebook data. We used many semesters worth of data, so we brought all that data together. We used uh, machine learning algorithms I mentioned earlier to mine that data, produce a predictive model. And then we rolled this out to a number of institutions as part of our research study. So in near real time, data from these courses are flowing into our predictive model. Scoring process happens to identify which students would be at risk to not complete their course successfully. And then uh, ultimately the instructor receives what we call an academic alert report, which the, uh, identifies those students that need help and the instructor can then intervene with those students. 
So a uh, little bit on our research design, uh, we, we ended up, we rolled this out to about 2,200 students, uh, four institutions, two community colleges, and two historically black college universities. And I think it's important to note that obviously, or maybe not obviously, but Marist is a mid-sized private four-year liberal arts institution. So they're, it's very different than these other partners that we roll this out to. And that was intentionally done to uh, look at this issue of portability of predictive models. So we were researching, if we had a model that was built on uh, data from Marist College, how well would that model perform when we used it in a very, very different type of institution with different uh, student populations? Uh, in most cases, we had uh, one instructor teaching three sections of the same course. And so one section acted as a control group for us. They received no interventions. And then the other two sections received one of two different interventions. That was the other thing we were researching was, was there uh, uh, one intervention that was more effective than the other? And then we, we ended up doing these predictions three times during the semester, about 25% into the semester, which works out to be that two to three week period into the semester, 50% in and 75% in. So I'll kind of conclude here by sharing some of the results results from, from that research. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the institution we are working with, Savannah State University, Cerritos College, Redwoods, and North Carolina A&T, were very different types of institutions. So if you just look, for example, at Pell Grant, number of percentage of students with Pell Grants at Marist College is about 16%, Savannah State about 78%. So again, a very different student population. Go to the next uh, slide. These are some of the results we found in terms of uh, the accuracy, let's say, of our predictive model. Again, this was a model built at um, uh, Marist College using data from our student populations. And now you see how accurate that model was when we used it at the other institutions. This was quite surprising to us. Quite honestly, we thought the accuracy would be in the 35 to 40 percent range. Uh, so we were quite intrigued to find that the model performed uh, maybe not at the highest level we would like, but certainly much higher than we were anticipating. We uh, replicated the study. We redid the study in fall of 2012 and found very similar findings. So that led us to feel like this wasn't just a, a random occurrence, but this really did seem to be, uh, the model seemed to be much more portable than we, we had assumed. And, and that really led us to conclude that there is a real potential here to be able to create a library of open models that are openly licensed. Anybody can come get the model and use it, but then use that openness to allow people to tune these models. So take the model, uh, the open model, bring it to your institution, use local data to tune that model to boost up that performance to a level that will work for your institution. And again, that's some of the work that we're, we're now uh, engaged in. And um, here we go. I have one more finding here, and then I'll show you where you can go to, to learn more about that work and, and actually download and access the, uh, uh, the, the uh, models and the work we did. So we also looked at the research interventions, and um, there's a lot of, of, of findings here I'm not going to have time to share. But what I think was most uh, important in our study was that we did find that the interventions that we deployed, uh, had, we found a statistically significant uh, finding that they had a positive impact on final course grades. So that really showed that the ability to identify a student and then intervene with that a student who is at risk uh, clearly is, is a way of improving student learning outcomes uh, in courses. So that was a very positive finding similar to some of the other findings we've had. So if you, uh, oh, yep, sorry, uh, some anecdotal feedback from, from faculty members was very positive. Um, so I think uh, uh, they certainly found it very valuable to have this information at their fingertips rather than kind of making some guesses at which students needed the most help. Uh, so uh, we'll make the slides available, but uh, all of the work that we did was published in the peer-reviewed uh, Journal of Learning Analytics in their inaugural issue, and so that's the reference there. Um, it's a 40-plus page uh, uh, research paper, so you can go very deep on this uh, work to see the details. And in that document, but we could also follow up, is links to the uh, GitHub and, and other repositories where you can go and get access to the open models that we've released, as well as the code and workflows, the ETL processing flows that we've also released under open licenses.
So with that, I'm going to now shift from some of the context and background to talk about some of the current work happening in the Aperio Learning Analytics Initiative. I should have maybe mentioned, if you're not familiar with Aperio, Aperio is the open source nonprofit higher education foundation that formed from the merger of the JSEC and Sakai foundations about two years ago. So just uh, put a little context there too. So some of the work that we're now focused on it really is captured by this uh, diagram that you're seeing, this we often refer to as the learning analytics diamond. And it's really kind of mapping out a vision for this open learning analytics platform that is emerging out of the Aperio work. Uh, there's kind of five components. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through these in, in great detail, uh, but you can see a collections component where we're uh, bringing data from various sources together, as I mentioned in earlier comments, a learning record store, we're a common repository for that data. Uh, the analysis component on the right side is really right now something referred to as the learning analytics processor, which is uh, kind of the next evolution of the OAI system that I uh, talked about already. Communications component is, is, you can think about that as a dashboard kind of component. And then we also are pushing results out from the learning analytics processor, not just to dashboards, but also to other systems that might want to take that information and go off and do something with it. Uh, so Josh, with that, wanted, yes. just wanted to take a quick time check. Um, are we ready to, to move on to Alan? I have one other snap slide in here, but. Yeah, we'll skip that one in the interest of time. So, yep, I was about to move over and turn it over to Alan Perfect. Berg, who is the community liaison for the Aperio Learning Analytics Initiative. He'll talk more about some of the current work that we're doing. Take it away, Alan. Hello, everyone. Uh, so this is only a five-minute section, so don't expect too much. This is uh, food fodder for the question and answer later. So what I'm going to argue is that it's not just about infrastructure. It's about a safe, uh, the PEA Learning Analytics Initiative is about a safe communal space to build up your experiences and insights and uh, build up requirements. So uh, a PEO uh, Learning Analytics Initiative started about a year ago. Uh, the, the, the biggest component uh, was uh, Josh's work, uh, sorry, Mautz's work around uh, in the Open Anal Anal Academic Analytics Initiative. Uh, but there was also work from the University of Amsterdam uh, on uh, connecting various pieces of software to uh, uh, using standards so that the activity from, for example, Sakai, which is a learning management system, UPortal, which is a student portal, and the Perio uh, OAE, which is the next generation. And uh, I noticed Nicholas, who's uh, the lead architect from that uh, uh, project, is here. So forgive me if I uh, mischaracterize it. It's a next generation collaborative learning system uh, can work uh, within a, uh, a learning analytics framework. Can, can I have the next slide, please? So this is the food for the question and answer later. And then I think the biggest thing uh, is uh, Gary's demonstration in a minute uh, uh, for, for you guys and girls. Uh, but uh, basically, these are the sort of questions we want to answer in the community. Uh, what is our understanding of infrastructure? We're in a state of flux because technology is changing. This is a good place to uh, discuss this. Uh, the Aperio Learning Analytics Initiative is a good place to discuss that. We can look at how to connect uh, activity streams into predictive models. There's emerging standards like Caliper and Experience AP. This is a place. Uh, policy around uh, ethics and privacy is a big bottleneck. Uh, it's one of the grand challenges for learning analytics as you move from departments to campus-wide to regional to cloud services. Uh, we can explore that within the community. Uh, under, uh, I think one of the major things is there's a lot of universities building dashboards uh, and some with success and some with real success and others uh, being built by the wrong people on the wrong requirements. So uh, bringing those requirements into the center and allowing people to hack away at that is also a way to minimize risk and to increase opportunity. Uh, Josh mentioned algorithms. Uh, PMML, for example, is a standard for transporting alg algorithms. It would be good to be able to transport our algorithms, have standard data sets. This is a great uh, community to go and share data sets with in. Uh, the human part of the integration is important. Uh, 
so how do we channel the predictive models into uh, uh, to help the student assistants uh, intervene as humans with uh, students? We've got the student success plan uh, as part of our software repertoire, and uh, that is uh, part of uh, is a uh, student assistant portal. And we have uh, interactions with other organisations like Solar and Lace. Uh, and I noticed Neil uh, Schaffer is here from JISC. Uh, the, the, this is a great place for different communities to intersect. Uh, other examples are uh, how do we transform data? Uh, or how do we transform raw uh, data into uh, and pre-process it to uh, help uh, the analytics process uh, like interventions and predictions? This is a, so all these questions uh, are going to be addressed or, or at least discussed within this community. And I believe, Kate, that's roughly my five minutes and we should go on to some demonstration from Gary uh, to show uh, that we're not just talking uh, vapor and that there's some actual software behind uh, our conversation. Yes, thanks, Alan. And just fo for folks, that was definitely a quick review of these key um, considerations here. Alan has detailed those things out in the slides, so you can go in and, and look at um, specific detail, a little bit more uh, information in, uh, under each of those headings, but we wanted to respect the time here. Um, so exactly. I'm going to actually, thank you. Um, so I'm going to actually, go ahead, Alan. Oh, I'm going to go. Uh, Oh, I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Maybe, Alan, you can mute. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Gary, who's going to do the, the demonstration here. I've had to share my screen here. We had a little bit of technology challenge with um, Big Blue Button, and so Gary's going to be sharing via a Google, a Google Hangout. Um, if you're not able to see this all that well, um, I believe there's an option in your view to kind of expand to full screen. Uh, so if you can find that, that might help to uh, make the screen a little bit bigger. Gary? Thanks, Kate. You want to jump to the slide first? Oh, sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm Gary Gilbert, uh, technology lead uh, at Unicom with a focus on integrations and analytics. And, and before we jump into the demo, I just want to give you a little bit of background about some of the projects that uh, we'll be working with today. Uh, the focus of the demo will be on the Open Dashboard project. Uh, Open Dashboard is a Uniform Services University funded project. Uh, it's a web application that provides a framework for the display of analytics data and visualizations on that data. Uh, and as part of the demo, Open Dashboard will be pulling data from a number of sources. Uh, one of those is OpenLRS. Uh, OpenLRS is another uh, project under the Aperio LAI uh, umbrella. Uh, it's a learning record store. Uh, that supports the Experience API, and we're starting to get some early stage support for uh, the IMS caliper specification. If you're not familiar with, a, with an LRS or a learning record store, you can think of it as an application uh, that provides a set of services to store and process uh, analytics data. And then the other piece of the demo uh, where the dashboard will be pulling data is the learning analytics processor. And, and Josh gave an overview, a good overview of that. Uh, it, the, Learning Analytics Processor is another web application um, that automates the execution of the predictive models. Uh, and in this case, it's the, uh, the Marist OAI uh, Early Alert uh, Intervention uh, Model. So each of these projects are, are standards-based, or is there a standards base as we could make them? Uh, so they can be used individually. Uh, you can take it, uh, plug it into an existing environment, use it as a standalone application, or they can be used collectively kind of in the analytics diamond sense. Um, we've worked really hard to make them play very nicely together. So they have a notion of a shared infrastructure. For example, if you're using a particular database, typically all of the applications within the suite uh, will be able to support that database. And they have a shared data model. So integration, uh, we try to make integration really easy. Uh, like most of the projects under the Aperio LAI umbrella, um, these products that we'll be looking at today are all Java web applications. Uh, the newer two, uh, OpenLRS and Open Dashboard, use the Spring Boot framework. Uh, for applications that have a UI component, we've chosen AngularJS and Bootstrap 3 as our front-end technologies. 
And on the back end, um, we've tried to make it as easy as possible to plug in different data stores. And currently, we have support for uh, Redis, Elasticsearch, and MongoDB uh, across the different applications. So what I'm going to show you during the demo uh, <clears throat> is an example of how you might be able to use these different applications, uh, the data from these applications, and provide a visualization of that in the dashboard. Um, just to really quickly talk about the different connection points, uh, Alan mentioned that Sakai has the ability to send XAPI information. We're doing that here in this demo. Uh, the Sakai course that we'll be demoing from uh, has sent uh, XAPI information, uh, student activity information to OpenLRS. Uh, Open Dashboard will be pulling that activity information uh, in XAPI format from OpenLRS. It will be pulling the output of the predictive model from the learning analytics processor, and that's in a custom JSON format. And Open Dashboard just pulls those things on a per course basis. So we're only getting the data for the course that we're accessing from. And to get to Open Dashboard, uh, we'll be doing an LTI tool launch from Sakai. So I'm going to go ahead and, and jump over it if you want to switch to the Hangout. All right. I want to see if folks can see this. Let's see. Uh, Josh, can you confirm you can see the Sakai screen? Yep, looks good. Excellent. And again, uh, if if this is small, it, it's kind of tough for for us to adjust here. So if folks can uh, uh, choose the option to display full screen, that may help. Thanks, Gary. Sure, and I, I apologize. I I have uh, technology issues with the blue button. So, um, so I'm in Sakai. I'm going to log in as an instructor, and I'm going to navigate to the course that I set up. And I've already set this course up with the roster information grade book, activity information, those kind of things. Uh, and then when I click on <coughs> the Open Dashboard link, it's going to do an LTI tool launch out to Open Dashboard from Sakai. And this Open Dashboard instance is running on my local computer. And so the first thing you're going to see here is this welcome screen. And that's because we haven't set up the connection of this Sakai course to a set of dashboards within Open Dashboard. Uh, Gary, your connection has gotten gotten really choppy all of a sudden. I just wanted to let you know if there's anything you can do. The the audio or video? Audio. Audio. Hmm. Uh, how's that? I'm a little bit closer. Okay, thanks. So Open Dashboard has the uh, concept of dashboards, which you could think of as analogous to a page. Uh, and the concept of cards, which which are really self-contained uh, applications, similar to a portlet or, or, or a widget. Um, and dashboards can have one or more cards on them. Open Dashboard also provides the ability to pre-configure a set of dashboards such that anybody accessing that instance of Open Dashboard will receive those dash that set of dashboards. And that's that's really to avoid the need for instructors uh, or administrators to have to configure things on a per course basis. So when I go ahead and click get started here, it's going to create the mapping of this Sakai course to a set of dashboards. It's going to add uh, the dashboard that I pre-configured, and it's going to add the roster card to that dashboard. And then I'll talk about what happened uh, after you see it. So <clears throat> the mapping of the Sakai course to the set of dashboards occurred. Uh, the roster card was added. Uh, and the roster card made three service calls. It called back to Sakai to get uh, the roster data for the course. It made the call to OpenLRS to get all of the activity data for the course. And it made the call to the learning analytics processor to get the output of the predictive model uh, for this course. It merged all of that data together, performed some very simple calculations on it, and then rendered it out here. So you can see that we have a listing of each student, uh, the last time they did something within the course, their activity level relative to everyone else in the course, and their risk assessment based on the predictive model from the learning analytics processor. So I think that's a good example of, of what you can do today uh, with some of these projects. Um, all of these projects are available in GitHub. Uh, I encourage you to uh, go in there and, and take a look uh, and, and provide any feedback. And that's it for the demo.
Great, thank you. And if folks have questions, um, please please do enter them into chat. I'm going to return back over to the slide deck. And we're going to get uh, Alan back up on deck. So I'm going to wait a few seconds until I can see the slides. Uh, and perhaps I'm going to hum some lift music. <laughs> Are you not able slides. to see the slides? No, not at all. Uh, perhaps it's me. Perhaps uh, there's some technology involved. Gary or um, Josh, can you see the slides? Yeah, I can see the slides. Okay. Yeah, I can as well. Oh, dear. So the, <laughs> best, uh, the best laid plans are mice and men. I'm going to wing it a little bit. I, I can sort of semi-remember what's on the slides. Uh, okay, I've got it up. Okay, that's cool. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, engaging uh, in the Aperio Learning Analytics Initiative. Uh, so basically, we're working in a duocracy. Uh, and what that means is if you see a problem uh, and uh, you want to involve yourself, rather than telling me you or the rest of the community we've got a problem, we try to empower you uh, to solve that problem. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, I want to uh, be involved in hackathons, so I'm helping organize hackathons. Sandeep, who's uh, uh, at this meeting, is warding the incubation process for this uh, learning analytics initiative. The incubation process is a process within the Aperio community to move uh, the uh, software from uh, a certain state, review it, uh, look at the licensing, uh, look at the quality, uh, bring mentors in to uh, give advice, how to advertise the projects in the community, and then help you launch into the wider community. Now, Sandeep wants to award that pro wants that process to happen, so he's leading that. There's a, a gentleman, uh, a, a, a good colleague of mine called Patrick Lynch from Hull University. He's a communications officer, uh, and he's defending the requirements of students. He cares vehemently about the requirements of students. Uh, Kate's. Uh, who's running uh, the slides at the moment, so I have to be very nice to her. You're a very nice person, Kate, is also dealing with marketing and communication, and she's an evangelist. I'm not even going to bother to mention uh, Josh's roles because there's so many of them. And Gary, as you can see, builds the living daylights out of learning analytics and is a great sanity check on the uh, practical application of uh, the software. Uh, next slide, please. So how do you engage? So uh, I sort of foolishly tried to inject some of my humor. So uh, you know, if you don't laugh, I understand. I won't be able to hear you even if you did laugh. Uh, but at level one ninja, uh, you should uh, start off by reviewing the home page. Uh, the link is here. Uh, this has some information. It's in a confluence, which is a kind of wiki. Uh, if you don't like the information there, feel free to come and contact me. And then you will end up having to update the uh, information. Uh, read the notes from the regular meetings, that's also on conference. Uh, the next stage is, of course, to join the mail list. This is a bit quiet at the moment because uh, we've been basically hanging out uh, 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 in conference calls, but this will get more busy as more people join in the conversation. So uh, joining the conversations, uh, lurk a little, uh, question a little, uh, and once you feel confident, start sending messages. And most importantly for the time being, as you build up your um, interest, then we meet every other Wednesday. Uh, uh, and Patrick announces out uh, through the distribution list. Uh, and you can join us on Cauliflower, which is a conference call system. And for an hour, we can discuss whatever you want. Uh, we have a, normally have the agenda on a Google Doc. And then. At level one, review GitHub, have a look at our software, start to get a feel for it. If you're a good programmer, you know, this means stuff to you. Uh, if you look at the readme's, that gives you information, points you to other things. And uh, if there's things missing, uh, come and talk with me and we'll see if we can involve you in uh, filling those gaps in or supporting us. Because uh, when there's a gap, it normally means there's a missing role somewhere. Uh, the next thing to do is to meet us at a birds of a feather at a conference or, as I said, online. And uh, as I keep trying to sell, uh, feel that you own a problem uh, and take a role on. And it has to be something you care about, otherwise it's not sustainable. So if there's something that you really want to see happen, try to evangelize that. 
and uh, see how much of the community you can activate and how can you achieve that. May I have the next slide, please? Now, uh, the next level up is to buy me beer. Um, so uh, that, that, that's basically it. So I suppose we should have a next slide, which is a level three ninja, but after you bought me beer, beer, then consider hosting the hackathon. We've had a hackathon for two days at the University of Amsterdam, supported by SURF, which is the kind of national body, uh, to build an educational dashboard uh, or just gather the requirements because the requirements are very important. Uh, we've, there's also workshops, so consider ho uh, hosting one of these uh, on the subject of the Aperio Learning Analytics Initiative uh, or, or some part of that. Uh, there's material out there and other members of uh, this community are prepared to support. Uh, if you've got something to show, present it at a conference. Consider building a consortium up with other universities looking for grant proposals or new projects. Look at the projects within Aperio which are open source uh, uh, and some of them are used by millions of students every day. Consider looking at uh, parts of the uh, projects that need learning analytics enrichment and, and activate yourself and evangelate around that. Uh, well, obviously, I've just mentioned add parts to learning analytics initiative. Consider co-developing uh, with, for example, Maritz College or got a very good uh, set of predictive models. Uh, consider taking those models uh, to your context your university and then co-developing some of the uh, supporting infrastructures so that you can give back, back and not just take. And there's other things, and this is a question I wish to come to uh, in the question and answer section, consider acting as communication channel between organizations. Uh, I've had contact with a number of organizations and a number of organizations have contact with other members within, my, within the Learning Analytics Initiative. For example, SURF, which is uh, a Dutch body, JISC, uh, which is a UK body, Aperio, which is an international body, SOLAR, uh, which is a researcher's body, LACE, which is a European evidence hub, UNICON, University of Amsterdam, Mads, Hull, Oxford, and there's probably a range of other names I should have put there. Consider acting as a communication channel and uh, help us filter the information so that we can interact with these different organizations. Uh, okay. Which leads us on, I assume, to. Oh, so it's, it, I saw a white screen. Uh, it's, uh, it is a white screen. It was a plug for the LAC conference, and uh, I'm not sure why it didn't show up here. So, Sorry about that. Uh, this, this, uh, in my, uh, Josh, can you uh, unmute and give a quick plug for the LAC conference? Sure, yeah, no problem. It's probably because there was a big picture overlay of that slide that probably didn't make it through, no problem. Yeah, so the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference, which is the uh, large uh, international org uh, conference for academic researchers in the learning analytics space, will be taking place the week of March 16th here at Marrows College. Um, and maybe in the chat window in a minute, I'll put in the URL for that conference um, website. It is uh, something we're hosting for the Society for Learning Analytics uh, and Research, or SOLAR. And so that might be an event you might be interested in coming to. And Alan, do you want to mention Open Aperio? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, so in June, uh, there's also a conference for the Open Aperio uh, Sorry, for the Aperio Foundation, it's global conference. It'll be held in Baltimore. Uh, there will be a link somewhere. But basically, there's a workshop uh, about the infrastructure that Gary just explained, and Gary will be leading that. There's four interrelated presentations around learning analytics. It's going to be a birds of a feather. Uh, there's potential uh, for face to faces, so you can find me and talk to me and other people on this call. And uh, as I said, the most important thing is to give me beer uh, because that's what uh, energizes me. And more details to, to come, so we'll uh, probably update uh, the website. The website for this will be updated. So I believe that moves on to the uh, question and answers, if I'm correct. And and if I could just uh, before we take questions, just one second, because there was two things I forgot to mention. So Alan, that was great. Thanks uh, for that overview. Great, uh, Gary, on the demo. I did want to mention Sandeep Jayaprakash, who's on the call but didn't present, uh, most part because 
Uh, Sandeep is really the brains here at Marist College for all this work, uh, and he's been so busy doing this work that uh, he we decided not to have him present today, but I did want to mention him because he really plays a uh, central and lead role here. The other quick point was just around the demo, and I just want to emphasize to people that although the work we've done previously has been with the Sakai Learning Management System, this work is really very LMS agnostic at this point, so we have no institutions using Blackboard and Moodle that we're working with, and we're looking for to uh, diversify even further. So I just wanted to make that point because sometimes people see this as a Sakai-only thing, and that's not uh, not the case. So sorry, Kate, just wanted to jump in with those before we uh, took questions. Nope, no problem. Those are great points. So uh, hopefully folks have gotten uh, an overview. We had an hour. We tried to stay to 45 minutes. We've done pretty well there to give uh, time for Q&A at the end, but it is a lot of information to cover. So if if you have questions, clarifications for anything that's been presented, or if you felt something was missing and you'd just like to talk about it, please um, put your questions in chat. Uh, Josh, there is a question that popped up during your um, initial overview, which was um, the nature of the interventions that Marist um, uh, played with during your research time. Can you address that? Sure. There was kind of two intervention strategies we were looking at or used. One is something that we refer to as an awareness intervention. This is pretty simplistic. Uh, basically, students received a message that was kind of uh, the text of which was predefined for, uh, from the instructor that would kind of alert them to some concern about their performance and then recommend specific uh, follow-up actions like come see me in my office or uh, you might want to go see a, a tutor and so forth. We designed that rather specifically to replicate the types of interventions that were taking place at Purdue University, where as folks may know, there's a lot of pioneering work. Uh, John Campbell, Kim Arnold, and others uh, there got a lot of this kind of stuff started around early alert systems and LMS data. So we were partially comparing our results to theirs. So we wanted to have an intervention that was very similar to what was going on at Purdue. The other intervention we were exploring is something we called an online academic support group. Um, and the idea there was students receive the exact same message, actually, so the same text. Uh, but it, then the recommendation would be to join this online academic support group. This was an online environment where students get access to uh, OER materials, open educational resources, designed primarily around remediation of basic skills, math, writing, and so forth. Uh, there was uh, academic support specialists in the uh, online environment. They weren't there to answer subject-specific questions, but they were there to direct students to campus-based resources like a tutoring office and, and so forth. And the real intent there was to look at whether or not a community and being involved in an online community would be better than just getting an a, a, a individual, in a sense, intervention. Uh, what we did find was that there was no difference uh, between the impact of uh, one intervention over another. They both had statistically significant impacts on student performance, but there wasn't you know, a difference between the two. And we think that's probably a result of the fact that the message that students received was exactly the same between the two interventions. So that led us to believe that it was simply making students aware of and surfacing the issue and concern that uh, that made the real difference in terms of student deciding to take some action and improve or, or not. Thank you. Uh, so far we haven't had any other questions pop up here. I'm sure that folks have open things that they're wondering. Um, Josh, are there common questions that you get that you might uh, throw out there? Uh, there's, there's many. I think, um, you know, one might be around uh, the uh, the. Oh, here we got a question. We do have a question here. Thank you, uh, Tony. Uh, how do early alerts vary for face-to-face -face versus online or hybrid courses? If that work has been explored. Yeah, good question. So, all of the work, the data that we worked with in our OAI project was uh, the vast majority, I'd say, of that data was coming from face-to-face -face classes that was using the learning management system. Uh, so these were not uh, fully online courses, uh, which I think sometimes people assume, but really face-to-face -face courses using the LMS <clears throat> to enhance that instruction. Um, 
subsequently, more recently, we've taken that model that we developed under OAI and tuned it to be used in a graduate level, fully online program here at Marist. Uh, it's our Master of Public Administration. Um, and, and there, for example, in, in, in the, the earlier work we did, since there were face-to-face -face courses, the model, for example, didn't include uh, data coming from uh, online discussion activity. We didn't have enough online discussion happening in our face-to-face -face courses, maybe for obvious reasons. I'm meeting face-to-face, they were doing too much online discussion. So we didn't have enough data to really include that uh, element in our predictive model. Once we went and looked at the data coming from our fully online master degree program, where there's obviously a lot of online discussion taking place, we then had enough data to, to include it in the model. So as we tuned the model for that program, we brought in online discussion activity as one of the elements that we looked at in, in the model in terms of determining student risk of not doing well in the course. So that's just a concrete example there. Let's see, there's another question that came in here too. Great. We have yep. We have a question from Alex at Notre Dame around uh, how long this takes to establish on campus and how many people um, are required and, and how much time. Alex, can you just uh, confirm for us is this kind of a learning analytics environment more generally, or um, deployment of the actual predictive model specifically, the intervention specifically? If you can just give us a little bit of uh, scope around your question. And, and I'll just uh, I'll just mention here, Alex, while you're you're getting us some additional information. I'm not sure if you can speak uh, or if you need to do it in chat, but um, there I, I think that if you're talking learning analytics environment more generally, it depends on which components that you're looking to deploy and and what kinds of systems you're looking to to hook them up to. So if you think back to the diagram that we presented um, that has all uh, that Josh referred to as the diamond and I'll try to back up to it um, it does have several different components to this and um, we at, at Unicon see a lot of people focused on just trying to get get started in kind of this collection area so trying to just get data out of the systems that where learning activity information is being collected and get that stored somewhere so that it can be worked upon so you know that's kind of a, a place to start um, to get off of zero to start to, to collect your data in a common place, get that data clean so that it can be fed into this kind of analysis piece, piece which is where Josh is focused on the learning analytics process or the predictive modeling itself, and then back into the dashboards, back to uh, intervention systems like SSP. Um, so I think it depends on which components of those uh, you're looking to, to um, implement. Um, and you know how many systems you have that are going to be plugging into um, learning record storage and, and things like that. So unfortunately, I can't give more of a detailed um, estimate on that without knowing really the scope of what you're looking at. Uh, but uh, Josh or Alan or Gary, I'd be happy to have you to uh, supplement that answer. Uh, I think one thing I'll add to that, Kate, is that uh, you know I think you did a great job outlining you know outline outlining, excuse me, uh, some of the technical things and, and things you need to be thinking about there. I think there's also just kind of a, a organizational component to rolling learning analytics out. This is a really new technology. I often make the uh, kind of analogy to this, what learning management systems were at the time, course management systems were like back in the you know mid-1990s. Uh, there were new technologies. People saw huge potential in them. There was a lot of buzz around them, but nobody knew exactly where they were going to go, and they have had broad consequences and, and impacted significantly on how the operations of colleges. And I, I think learning analytics represents a, a similar fundamental critical technology that, that has a big impact. So what I'm getting at on a practical level is there's the technical component of rolling these things out. There's then things like ethics and privacy policies and issues that you have to address. There's the intervention side. There's the, uh, you know, the, the working with faculty members to make sure they understand how to advise students and intervene. I'll tell you that from our work, the tone of the message that students get 
from an instructor and an intervention is really critical to the outcome. So a message that makes the student feel like they're stupid and they failed and that, you know, this is all their fault doesn't result in what you usually want, whereas a message of, uh, you know, I'm here to help and, and, and want to reach out to you, you know, does. So I think there's that human component that, that's really uh, important as well. I see Alan raising his hand here, so I should shut up and let him talk for a minute. <laughs> Hi, so I want to, so I'm going to keep plugging the community. Uh, one of the things I've seen repeated across uh, different organizations as they come and talk to me is uh, that sometimes the wrong people are gathering the requirements. So uh, there's a difference between the, uh, you know, the learning analytics and the uh, other types of analytics. And one of them is the audience. Uh, make sure that your requirements are gathered by the right audience, and not by managers. Uh, make sure your project portfolio uh, represent real uh, requirements and not interpretive requirements. And one of the ways to avoid that is simply to involve yourself in a wider community and share your risks around requirements. Uh, because other people, uh, we're not all, all special and we don't have special, all have very specific requirements for our universities. Uh, so uh, make sure you jump on board the knowledge that's already been built up in this community. Uh, and uh, make sure that you don't uh, repeat uh, any patterns or mistakes around, uh, you know, uh, use, uh, having the wrong audience, uh, sorry, the wrong decision uh, making, uh, decision makers decide how you're, you're going to implement your learning analytics uh, within your organization. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Josh. Um, we did get a couple more questions come in. So, Gary, I'm going to ask you to take this one. Uh, there's a question from Sean about a getting started guide for setting up the components and guidance for picking them. Uh, the, the URL, Sean, that you shared with us is definitely the page that's going to give you context around the projects themselves. But, Gary, can you talk a little bit about how to actually pick up the code? Sure. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll um, paste the link to GitHub. Uh, in the chat shortly, uh, but GitHub's the place uh, to go. Uh, the uh, Perio LAI uh, GitHub page, uh, and under that, there'll be listings for each of the projects. Um, all of the projects have instructions on how to set them up. Um, some have uh, very, very detailed instructions for setting up a production-like environment, uh, but at, at a minimum, um, they have instructions for setting up a development environment and getting something going for demonstration purposes. Great, thank you. Um, on to the next question we have from Pat. What standards can we encourage other sources of learning activities to follow, like ePortfolio products, so that they can more easily be plugged into this platform? Who wants to take a stab at that? Maybe I will at a high level uh, briefly. But yes, I think that the, the standards in this space, I, I consider to still be emerging. Um, the two that Aperio has been working with, one is the IMS Caliper, standards, uh, the sensor API, for example, as well as um, the experience API coming out of the ADL group. Um, there, there may be others out there as well. But I think we're very actively in a, in a mode of, of exploring and experimenting and using all of the standards that are out there and, and looking at their you know, strengths and weaknesses and, and, and that kind of thing. So I, I personally don't know that we're at a stage where any one standard can be identified as, as the one that is, is best to be using. What I've encouraged institutions to do is, is what we're doing at Aperio, which is a big, begin to get involved and explore them. Uh, so that as they evolve and, and mature, um, you can make an informed decision. Great. This is Alan. And, yep, Alan, go ahead. So uh, I wanted to uh, plug the uh, hackathon at the LAP conference. And, uh, and by the way, you're more than welcome to run your own hackathons. Uh, at that hackathon, uh, it's going to be for two days. And uh, we start to play about with real realistic infrastructure. So that, uh, and Gary has done, uh, and Kate have done a magnificent job in, uh, you know, really pushing forward with that infrastructure and organizing around that. And that infrastructure will include, uh, probably include Caliper, definitely include uh, uh, the um, ADL Net Experience API. Uh, you're going to have the open dashboard there. You can have connections to Sakai. Uh, Gary might be able to tell you the more details, but as uh, we had a hackathon at Uber, and we're going to progress through a series of hackathons. 
then uh, people can start to play with this infrastructure uh, this, uh, and to understand it, get the fingers into it uh, and ask all good questions and move the conversation forward within at least a period learning analytics uh, initiative. Um, so that was one point. The other point is uh, documentation is never finished and uh, there's bound to be all kinds of things that would make life easier. I had a comment from one of my colleagues the other day about blogging a bit harder. Uh, we live in a community which is a duocracy uh, and in that community you have a core which is uh, very hard working and a wider set of consumers. Uh, I would love uh, to see uh, people find roles uh, within the core uh, and, and excel at what they want. So for example, uh, if you're not happy with the documentation, uh, pick a piece you're not happy with, uh, contact me and let's see if we can help you generate that documentation. I'll give you the floor again, Kate. Thanks, Alan. And uh, we're at the end of our hour here. I do see we have a couple of questions from John and one from uh, Jan. And we will absolutely answer those. We'll actually get a transcript of this chat into the slide deck so that when we share it out, um, we are, you'll be able to see that and get answers to those things. Um, if there's any follow-up that anybody wants to do uh, with any of the speakers, we did publish their email addresses at the end of the presentation. So feel free to reach out directly uh, if you want to get involved, have questions that you want to follow up with um, directly on anything that's been presented here. And uh, mostly we just want to thank everybody for your interest um, today and hope to continue this conversation with you um, going forward. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again, Kate. All right. Have a good day, all. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.